Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is John Lindsay Poland. I'm with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And welcome to this webinar on unraveling the Pentagon's foreign presence uh, with David Vine and Catherine Lutz. Um, this is a one of a series of webinars that uh, FOR, the Fellowship, has organized in order to help people strengthen their skills on researching U.S. militarism and ways that, that serve activism uh, around U.S. militarism. Um, so we've had an, a number of others that are posted on our website at forusa.org slash militarism dash watch. And um, today we are very happy to have um, David Vine and Catherine Lutz with us um, David is a uh, professor of anthropology at an American University and has been working on issues of foreign military bases for a number of years. Uh, he and I uh, worked together in 2009 on a, uh, a, f a national, international conference on foreign military bases called um, Security Without Empire, held at, at his university, and has published a book on... Um, one of uh, one of the key foreign military bases uh, of the United States in Diego Garcia, which he'll talk about um, in a few minutes, and since then has also um, been doing further research on foreign military bases, uh, including their their costs. Uh, Catherine Lutz is uh, also an anthropologist at Brown University and at the Watson Watson Institute, um, and has uh, written extensively on foreign military bases, uh, including a work about the communities in North Carolina around bases there, and then edited um, the book Bases of Empire, um, and is uh, currently a coordinator of uh, a, a very strongly related project called Co Costs of War, which I believe she will also be uh, mentioning. Um, a couple housekeeping things um, before David begins his presentation. We are uh, recording this webinar uh, and it and the slideshow that um, David will present, as well as some handouts, will be posted after the webinar uh, on our website at forusa.org. Um, so that, uh, and we will send out the link to that to people who have registered for the webinar. Um, the uh, in order to participate, we we have um, you all on mute so that we don't hear. Um, people's uh, kids and buses in the background and so on. Um, but if you want to participate, we highly encourage it. Um, and you can do so um, during the pre during uh, David and Catherine's presentations by posting questions or comments uh, in the control panel. Um, there's a one box that says questions um, and another that says chat. And uh, we will be monitoring those. Um, over the course of the uh, presentations and afterwards, and uh, so that we can pass on your questions and comments um, to David and Catherine. Um, David and Catherine will talk for about 30 minutes or so, and then uh, we will spend the rest of the hour in uh, uh, questions and answers um, with, with, and comments with you all. So, um, with that, I will uh, turn it over to David and um, just say thank you for, for being with us today. Thank you so much, John. Um, and do let me know, uh, and I guess let John know and the other technical folks if you can't hear me. Um, this is something of an odd experience talking to people I can't see. Um, but I, I really do feel incredibly honored to have been asked um, I um, I, f I feel honored to have been asked and, and actually really don't feel qualified in many ways. Um, people like John and Cassie have been doing this work for, for far longer than I and, and, and many others, um, all of whom I feel like are my mentors and teachers and um, are, um, from whom I'm learning things about bases on a daily basis. Um, and of course, there's way too much for any one person to know about the entire global network of, of U.S. bases overseas with more than a thousand bases outside the 50 states and, and Washington, D.C. 
um, and w it, with a system that, of course, has very little transparency. And when there is some transparency, when government does provide information, when the Pentagon provides information in most cases, often the information isn't accurate. Um, so it makes it an extraordinarily difficult task to, to wrap one's mind around and, and to um, find accurate information. So I'm going to try to to share some of the, the research I've done, some of the approaches I've taken to learning something about the global network of, of bases, um, and then think through what we can what we can do with that information. Um, I am in the process, as, as John referred to, of working on a book about the, the global network of bases and and their broad effects on their effects on locals, on military personnel and their families, on the environment, on U.S. and global peace and security, um, among other effects that that the global network has. Um, because it's just me doing this work, uh, and because I don't want it to take the rest of my life, I, I really feel like I'm a, I'm something of a, a generalist. Um, I hope my knowledge is relatively broad, but often I fear it's not very deep. So I'm really looking forward to questions and comments and corrections um, from people on the line, um, many of whom, again, are, are people from whom I've been learning about bases for years now. Um, I, I do want to say that I think it's uh, should be an incredibly optimistic time for people who care about the issue of, of U.S. bases overseas, um, with signs of what could be, you know, cuts to the Pentagon budget that we haven't seen since the last century. Um, military bases themselves have been a very obscure topic, unfortunately, um, known only to activists mostly overseas um, and to a small group of think tank types and. Uh, and academics, um, but in recent years, there's suddenly really been widespread interest in the the issue of bases, um, and unusually bipartisan interest, um, ranging from people like Nick Kristof to um, former Texas Senator K. Bailey Hutchison um, to high-ranking military officials, Ron Paul, among many others, who see overseas bases as an easy way to cut the Pentagon budget at a time when uh, budget debates have been have been swirling around DC and around the country. Um, so in this context, we see here we go. Kathy will talk about the cost of war, which is an incredible project and really a model for I think the kind of work many of us want to be doing. Um, uh, in this context, we, we see signs that, that, that bases overseas are, are being closed, consolidated, um, really very encouraging. Um, let me just quickly, uh, unfortunately I'm going to move quickly through a lot of this. Um, I'll move too quickly, um, but as John said, the PowerPoint will be available online and I see the PowerPoint as something of a, a common shared resource um, for anyone to use, to add to, to correct, to adapt. Um, so I apologize for going quickly, but uh, of course we can also get into some of the details more during the question and answer session. Um, it is, of course, worth remembering the sort of broader context of uh, the U.S. global base network, um, and that, of course, is, is the larger context of, of U.S. military spending. Um, I'm not going to go into that, although several people asked for that sort of information. I'm instead going to point you to the other fabulous webinars that John and FOR have been doing. Um, they provide, and this is from one of them, um, important details about um, the, the, the scope of U.S. military and national security spending uh, much more broadly. Um, just to give you a quick sense of what I'm going to try to do, um, provide something of a uh, an overview of the basics about bases, um, then sort of dive into how one goes about researching the financial cost of bases, point to research that one can do about other non-financial costs, um, I'm going to point to some research principles and key resources that I think can be of, of, of help, and again I probably won't go into much detail there, but th those resources, the lists will be um, part of the PowerPoint available online touch, of course, on anti-base movements and how we put uh, knowledge and our research to use um, in a variety of ways. 
Um, and then Cassie's going to jump in, um, talk about the Cap Costs of War project, and offer some some other important perspectives from her long um, career of, of researching military bases before we open things up to a to question and answer. So one of the ways I, I come to the issue of overseas bases um, is is by asking, you know, how do we make this issue visible to people in the United States? It's a challenging task. Bases overseas are really, you know, at the margins of most people's consciousness in the United States at best. Um, so how do we get people here to connect to the issue? Um, I think, you know, one one way to do it um, is humor. Um, this was a, a, a bumper sticker that we put together for the conference John mentioned. Um, we can show them images like this. Bizarrely, Scooby-Doo apparently is also at Guantanamo Bay. Um, these are photographs from, from some of my research for the book I'm working on. Um, I think another way is to, to, to try to connect issues related to domestic bases um, to issues overseas. So, for example, um, in the neighborhood where I grew up and where I now teach, um, there was a World War I military base um, that left behind hundreds and hundreds of buried chemical munitions and other weapons of mass destruction um, that are still being dug up to this day. Uh, another way I've approached it is um, to tell the story of Diego Garcia, which, as John mentioned, was the subject of my first book. Um, I've been studying Diego Garcia since 2001. Diego Garcia is not, the, of course, the Mexican artist who is married to Frida Kahlo. Um, instead, it's the small, secretive island in the middle of the Indian Ocean um, that's home to a major U.S. Navy and Air Force base. Um, it's the base that helped to launch both Gulf Wars and the invasion of Afghanistan. It's been used to threaten Iran. Um, it has been found to have held at least uh, a handful of terrorist suspects um, after the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, and to create the base in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the U.S. and British government, it's a British-controlled island, took the entire indigenous Chagosian people of Diego Garcia uh, and deported them from their homeland, dumping them in exile 1,200 miles away in Mauritius in the Western Indian Ocean and the Seychelles. Perhaps one of the most telling documents that I found in my research about Diego Garcia and the story of the expulsion of the Chagosians was this one I found in the Navy archives. It's from the highest-ranking official in the Navy, Admiral Elmo Zumwalt. It was the final expulsion order. It consisted of exactly three words, absolutely must go. Meanwhile, the military to this day refers to the base as the footprint of freedom, with no sense of the irony that that, of course, entails for the Chagosians. Um, the research that I, I've been doing on Diego Garcia since um, 2001 resulted in this book that John mentioned um, and really opened up my eyes to the global network of bases. Uh, one of the first moments where I, I really was sort of shaken into awareness was, was consulting this really critical fundamental base research resource, um, fundamental resource for bases research, and that's the base structure report. Um, it's put out annually, as many of you know. Um, usually around October. Um, and when I first saw it, I was just sort of shocked into awareness. Um, you know, by the Pentagon's own tally, um, the United States currently has 760 base sites, to use the Pentagon's language, outside the 50 states in Washington, D.C., a grand total of 5,200 or more base sites worldwide. It turns out this is j actually just the beginning. Um, we don't have a, uh, an authoritative count of the total number of bases, but it's clear that the total easily exceeds 1,000. Um, the 760 Pentagon number excludes all the bases in Afghanistan, previously excluded bases in, in Iraq, um, and excludes a number of 
other well-known bases as well as, of course, secretive bases. Um, so with um, at one point upwards of 550 bases in Afghanistan alone, you can see how, how, how quickly you can get to beyond 1,000. And even with uh, the base closures going on in, in Afghanistan, we're still easily over 1,000. Nick Terse, um, who, who you see cited at the bottom of the page, um, is probably done the best accounting, and he got to 1,075 and could have gone further. Um, as you can see, there's still hundreds of bases in Germany, Japan, um, South Korea, and Italy have large numbers to this day. I mentioned Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, there's the question of what is a base. Um, perhaps we can get into this more in the question and answer. It's a, it's a complicated question. Um, Pentagon uses the language of base site. Each of the armed services has different terminology for their bases. Um, but just to give you a sense, the, the base sites range in size from, from offices or warehouses um, to radar stations to massive uh, bases with tens of thousands of troops and, and family members like Rammstein Air Base base in, in Germany. But So 84% of DOD's reported sites are, are classified as small base sites. So one might think, oh, you know, okay, so most of them are just, you know, small offices and such. Um, then you look at the fi fine print and see that small base sites can be up to $915 million in reported value. So even small base sites are not all that small in many cases. Um, for example, Luxembourg, I, you wouldn't think there's enough room to have three bases in, in Luxembourg, but there are with a total of 65 buildings, according to the Pentagon. Okay, let me sort of move quickly so we don't run out of time, or so I don't run, of run out of time. Some other statistics to give you a sense of the total scope of the global base network. Um, troop presence in 166 countries, although it's important, um, I, I think and John has pointed me to this, that, that we should really focus on, on military presence um, as much as bases in many ways. Um, but I think, you know, we don't need to consider a handful of Marines at an embassy a real military presence. I think we have to think you know, military presence is really when you get beyond a few Marines guarding an embassy, in my mind. Again, that's something we could discuss. Um, we also have to think, when we think about the global network of the Navy's aircraft carriers, 11 aircraft carriers, a growing presence in space. And then we get to the issue of what does this all cost? Um, Pentagon nicely puts together an overseas cost summary on a yearly basis at the request of Congress. Um, I found this and shows that uh, according to the Pentagon, it all costs about $22 billion a year. Um, that's a lot of money, uh, clearly. Um, and I found this very helpful initially, and then until I started looking at the overseas cost summary a little bit more closely, and started to realize that there was a whole lot the Pentagon wasn't including in the cost summary. Hopefully, I don't know if well, you saw that. I don't want to. Okay. Um, so, Pentagon's estimate. Meanwhile, Anita Danks, an economist, um, came up with a radically different figure of $250 billion, or about a quarter of the Pentagon's annual budget, being dedicated to U.S. bases and troops overseas. Um, so, what I try to do is dive into the, the really the weeds of Pentagon budgeting. Um, which is, again, very challenging because the Pentagon, Pentagon can't even pass an audit. It's the only agency in the U.S. government that can't pa pass an audit. Unclear when it will. Um, but I tried to dive in and see, you know, what, how, do we, what, what, how do we make sense of what, what we're really spending on a yearly basis. Um, and in a, an article I published on TomDispatch.com, I showed that actually by my estimate, of, and a very conservative estimate, let me let me point out, um, the United States is spending about 170 billion dollars a year currently on its bases and total military presence overseas, and and actually it could go up to 200 billion quite easily if if uh, one includes some other costs that I didn't 
include to be on the conservative side. Um, you see a citation for uh, for the article, um, and I have actually a, a longer, um, more detailed article available on, on my website. Um, this is the actually the technical or the, the uh, detailed figure, um, and here are the the citations for the, the two articles. Um, I'm going to try to quickly walk through some of how I did this um, calculation. Uh, hopefully, in the in the interest of of showing you where you can go to look for some of the costs of bases, whether it's an individual base or bases in a in a region like the Asia Pacific or Latin America, um, as well as as certain kinds of costs. Um, hopefully, this can point you in some helpful directions. This is the sort of total accounting I did. Um, let me just point uh, first of all that there were several missing countries um, that the Pentagon didn't include in its overseas cost summary. Um, this is the, the list of, and if you just quickly look at the at the list, you'll you'll notice that some countries are missing. Um, one place to find data on some of those countries um, comes in uh, one of the president's budget documents for contingency operations. Um, you'll see data on uh, what we're spending in Bosnia, Kosovo, Gitmo, um, and in Honduras, among other places. Next, um, the Pentagon excluded um, all spending in the U.S. territories. Um, a few places you can go to look for statistics on, on spending uh, in the territories, which I think we clearly have to consider overseas, and we could talk about that in more detail, but um, here are some, some resources for finding some data on, on spending in Guam, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, the Virgin Islands, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, then we have, of course, Navy vessels and, and personnel outside U.S. waters, um, which were excluded from the, the Pentagon's accounting, um, despite um, Congress's instructions, which I think would indicate that, that really they sh they should be included. Um, again, uh, important budget document operations and maintenance costs um, will will lead you to some of these costs. Um, then we have health care. Um, there's the defense health program um, and a whole range of defense wide spending. Um, that the Pentagon didn't include in its overseas cost summary, and you can see where you can find that data. Um, and there's the question of, of rent payments that the United States has to make, um, contributions to NATO, and um, funds that the United States receives from countries like Japan and South Korea. In fact, the U.S. is not receiving all that much in terms of cash contributions anymore, other than from Japan, South Korea, and Kuwait. Other countries like Italy, Germany, and, 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 and others are providing in-kind contributions increasingly, which are, are difficult to, to, to measure. Um, but you can get some of the information on, on both um, what we're paying, meaning the U.S. government is paying, and U.S. taxpayers, and what we're receiving um, from these resources. Sorry if you're seeing a, a that come up periodically. Um, then there's some other programs that government is um, pursuing overseas, the Pentagon is pursuing overseas, also not counted. You can see where you can find information about those. And clearly humanitarian programs, as many have written about, um, have clear military, they're, they're of course not simply out of the goodness of the Pentagon's heart, but have clear military aims. Um, there are, of course, classified programs, CIA programs, CIA paramilitary activities not included in the cost summary. Um, here are some useful resources to uh, learn more about those budgets, which, of course, are very difficult to get accurate information about, but this is, as far as I can tell, the, some of the best data available. Um, and then, of course, war costs, which were excluded from the overseas cost summary. Um, Cassie will talk later about the cost of war project, which I think probably provides the most accurate and comprehensive data on the costs of the wars since 9-11. 
Um, there's a Congressional Research Service report, which is also very helpful. Um, and uh, John is is prompting me to to move quickly, um, which I will. Uh, here again is the the total accounting. Okay, let me just point to a few uncounted costs here: um, offices, training facilities, currency exchange. I'll move quickly through this, and again, you can find it on in the PowerPoint. Um, NASA, space-based weapons, um, recruiting costs. We also have to think about non-budgetary costs to the U.S. economy, like income foregone by spouses and dependents who aren't working overseas they, when they would have been working in the United States. Um, we also have to think about trade-offs and opportunity costs, um, what we could be spending this money on that we're spending overseas. And again, the National Priorities Project and from one of the other webinars provided excellent information there. Um, move quickly. Um, we of course, have to think about other non-financial costs. Um, this is how I sort of conceptualize those costs. Displacement, like Chagosians faced, environmental costs, health costs, um, costs to local economies, damage to local economies. We also have to think about ways in which um, local economies benefit, but uh, often, the, as many, Kathy among others, have shown, um, benefits go disproportionately to local elites. Um, so we have to think carefully and, and in a complicated manner about where the money goes um, when, when bases are built and maintained overseas. Um, political costs, crimes, um, we have to think about exploitation and gender violence labor exploitation. I think it really is critical to remember that bases are places of labor, They're places where people work. Um, uh, we also have to think about the costs um, that military personnel and their family members bear, um, rising hostility, and then of course we can't forget that bases are about war, um, and bases help enable war. And we have to think about the deaths and injury and displacement and other effects of those wars. Um, here's some just some quickly some key research principles and resources in, in my mind. Um, first of all, be accurate. Um, I'm probably not careful enough in, in many ways, but I, I try to keep myself vigilant. Um, and again, some of the problem is just the, the breadth of the network and, and the uh, the difficulty in finding resources, but I think it's critical. Otherwise, we really undermine um, the arguments we want to make and, and discredit ourselves. Um, talk to locals. Visit bases overseas. Um, that's where you know you're going to find the, the most accurate information. Uh, most often, um, work collaboratively. There's just way too much to do, and, and I felt privileged to work with with Cassie and John and many including folks on this call. Um, listen to everyone. Ignore no one, in my mind. Um, you know, We can't think of members of the military as the enemy or as not worth listening to. Um, the aim of my book is to really understand um, the experience of, of military personnel at a range of levels um, and, and what their experience can help. Come up on um, 25 minutes. Um, so quickly, um, a few other principles. Um, be an investigative journalist. Um, don't take no for an answer. Ask people. It's remarkable that we often just forget to like call people. We, um, and Medea Benjamin recently knocked on the door of John Brennan and talked to him about drones. We don't do that enough. Um, Here's some resources. I think I'm going to run out of time, so I want to turn things over to Kathy. Um, I'll just quickly scroll through this. Um, but again, all these resources are um, on uh, part of the PowerPoint that will be posted online, um, government sources of various kinds. Um, I, there's a bibliography of key uh, books and articles, research tools range of research tools, websites, a few primers, the books and articles, some maps, 
films, anti-base movements, and this is just a small sample. And then some examples of how one can put the knowledge to use through the use of one pagers. Um, this is one example from the 2009 conference, um, but as you see, it needs updating. Um, another from the 2009 conference. Um, talking points also um, developed around the 2009 conference in Washington, D.C. Um, and again, the uh, very simple talking point, I suppose. And with that, I, I, I'll, I'll end and turn things over to Kathy. Sorry to have gone a little bit long. Thanks, Thanks David. so much, David. And um, Catherine, if and, I could uh, uh, just mm -hmm. let people know if you want to ask questions or make a comment, please do so um, uh, in the, the questions or chat box in your, in your control panel. And we'll be monitoring those and, um, and then taking those up. So I just wanted to put that out there. Go ahead, Kathy. Thanks. Great. Um, hi, everyone. And um, David uh, has just done a fantastic job of overviewing all the different ways that this spaces question and the question of militarism can be, can be researched and the, the, the range of, of resources that are out there. Um, but so my job is just to um, reiterate uh, what David said initially about uh, this being a very optimistic moment. I think uh, many of us see that um, uh, on this call. Uh, obviously, out of financial crisis as much as anything else, uh, as much as the failure of the two most recent military adventures of the United States. But um, I wanted to just give an example, uh, another very hopeful example. I've, I've um, uh, been working on this cost of war project, as David mentioned, and we just had a great week um, of uh, tremendous uptake in the media, um, the progressive media, the mainstream media, of, of the results of our research. And so I w just wanted to very quickly tell you how that project uh, is organized and, and uh, give you some sense of what we think um, made, it, made it work. Um, we are a group of about 29 scholars, uh, practitioners, um, you know, variety of folks with expertise in, in war and militarism um, who came together from a variety of perspectives, economics, anthropology, political science, and we decided uh, a couple of, about three years ago now, that we would uh, put together a comprehensive overview of the costs and consequences of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And to do that with an eye to public education, um, and to, but to start with this notion that we were doing very uh, rigorous, detailed papers on each of the different aspects of the problem, like the body count, like the environmental impact, like the uh, economic costs for Iraq and the economic costs for the United States. And so we, uh, but we did this with the eye that we would be working with the media uh, at the end uh, and so, and with the public in general. So we developed a website, we developed a relationship, um, in this case uh, for a variety of reasons, with Reuters New News Agency, uh, who we gave our report to uh, in, under embargo conditions as soon as it was completed so that they could write a story and then um, uh, in preparation for, in, again, both uh, the anniversary of 9-11 and most recently this week, in, in preparation for this 10th anniversary of the of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, um, we wrote our uh, web, website material um, based on those research papers. We used a lot of infographics and photographs and um, other uh, sort of bulleted highlights from the papers in order to make sure that people didn't ha have to wade through uh, a huge academic paper to get the basics. Um, but people could go to that uh, detailed, careful research um, to, to be able to, um, to understand the problem in more depth. Um, we ended up, um, at the end of this week, having over a thousand news outlets, including PBS NewsHour, Bill Maher, um, Hardball, um, Washington Post, you know, a whole series of Democracy Now!, different groups. Uh, reporting very specifically on the results of the of the research and uh, and I think uh, you know mainly I would I would just um, point out that the fact that we got tremendous uptake on this has something to do with how we did it but it also has something to do with the um, historical moment that we're in which is a one of tremendous opportunity as we know for 
um, the kind of work that you're all trying to do. And so this is, this is a very exciting time to be uh, researching militarism and, and bringing to the attention of the, the American public in particular the, the range of ways that this costs uh, the world and themselves personally. Um, and I think, you know, we can talk and I look forward to some questions maybe about um, what what's most important to focus on, but I think we decided to do a kind of cost-benefit uh, analysis because that is a commonly understood and well widely um, accepted paradigm even though uh, there, there are many others obviously the ethical and moral issues um, as this um, heart-wrenching photo that's uh, on our screen right now uh, indicates um, that the sort of ineffable losses that are involved but we, we did uh, I think in part get the uptake because um, there is a hunger for the kinds of um, of details and 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 also just a, a sort of pragmatic kind of approach rather than a, um, a a pragmatic approach to the question of of what's going on here and how can this system possibly make sense um, from a variety of ideological points of view. So I'll I'll stop there because the questions are going to be I think uh, especially important and uh, your insights from around. Uh, the country and the world, I guess. Right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, we've had a, a, a rich input of, uh, of comments and information. And again, I encourage people to post your questions and comments um, in the questions box in, in your control panel. Um, we have a question from Layla, uh, which is, if you could say something about the Fifth Fleet uh, in the Persian Gulf and Bahrain, because um, uh, you know, David, you mentioned the the very important uh, naval presence and sort of on the water presence that often is not counted as an overseas uh, presence, but is in fact uh, quite permanent. And I'm wondering if, if, in your research on costs, David, um, or if other stuff that, that uh, the Costs of War Project did, if you all found anything of a particular note about the fifth fleet. Kathy, do you want to take that first or No, I'm I'm afraid I don't know much about um the fifth fleet or the navy other than yes, I mean some of these uh, the pre-positioned ships, the um you know, you can see them off the coast of uh Saipan for example, just uh permanent uh positioning of of uh, material and ready for war and uh and obviously some of the warships as well are just, uh, as David pointed out, uh, very important to see as roving bases. Yeah, and I guess I would just add to that that, um, that, that of course, you know, the, the, the Fifth Fleet is headquartered in Bahrain and, and it's been quite obvious that the, that the Obama administration has muffled any criticism of the Bahraini government's crackdown on pro-democracy protesters um, because of the presence of the of the, the headquarters of the fifth fleet there and you know if you if you need just one example to show um, the sort of anti-democratic effects and the, the ways in which the, the US government supports authoritarian authoritarian or um, anti-democratic regimes just look at Bahrain um, we also just to pick up on what Kathy said. There's also a, a what's been called the mothership, a floating base that has been deployed to the Persian Gulf. It's part of the Fifth Fleet, um, and we also have to think about port visits when we think about overseas bases. Um, there are ports around the world um, that naval vessels visit, um, and they we might think of them as something like permanent, or sorry, temporary bases. And in many cases, it, uh, although they they range in and type right so the the cost in terms of human rights of these bases uh, shouldn't should also not be uh, underestimated um, there's a there's a question here from Zoltan Grossman who has also done extensive work on uh, overseas bases wondering if there are any campaigns to leaflet or, or do outreach to USGIs who are at overseas bases um, like what's happening at Fort Lewis and, and Fort Hood in Washington State. Um, they know of, of just a GI coffee house in Germany, um, but would like to be in contact with others. Um, I personally don't know of others, but I'm wondering actually if in, if in Japan or if in any other 
countries there might there might be something like that. Do either of you know of any? Of uh, a coffee house type. Um, at overseas base, or or, to, yeah, or no. other efforts to do you know to connect with GIs. No, I don't know, David. I guess what I've seen is that almost everywhere there there's some um, informal efforts, whether you know everything from just conversations with military personnel and family members to sometimes more formal leafleting of, of various kinds in Vicenza, Italy, near Venice. Um, there are actually some some creative efforts um, uh, of various kinds, including sending um, Thanksgiving Day cards um, uh, in a sort of sarcastic manner to thank uh, the U.S. military for taking away their green the people's green space and and the like. So there are, and at other times they've they've um, reached out in in less sarcastic ways. But um, I, I think you. you see examples of that on many bases worldwide. Uh -huh. uh, you were you were clicking out there for a, a minute, David. Um, there's there's a, a question from uh, from Barbara, uh, and I think she's referring to the map that we have in front of us, saying that she thought that the Ecuadorians kicked um, kicked out the base in in Ecuador, which is correct. So this base, this uh, particular map, I mean, is uh, is not up to date. That's why it has the big red needs updating. So, for example, there is also not a current U.S. base in Paraguay or Bolivia, um, and I suspect that might be true in other countries as well. But uh, and, and then there's, of course, new bases in a number of places. Um, uh, continuing with Latin America, um, my colleague Susana uh, Pimiento um, also works on military bases with the Continental Campaign Against Military Bases. And um, she notes that uh, she's asking whether the tally of bases includes uh, or the funding for it includes the new small bases that are currently being built in Latin America and other countries for, quote, uh, emergency and disaster centers. Uh, like there's one in uh, Concon in Chile. Um, there was also, you know, extensive operations in Haiti after the earthquake uh, military operations. And we're seeing that militarization in the name of natural disasters is, um, is one of the things that, uh, that the Continental Campaign is, uh, is concerned about. Um, that a lot of this humanitarian assistance is not um, has other objectives um, uh, to it. Um, and Susanna's question uh, for Catherine is also is whether on your assessment of the cost of war, you're accounting for the um, cost overruns that come from uh, the military's humanitarian operations. Um, she's seen references to studies that the um, cost overrun or or uh, overcost of those kinds of operations when when they're done by the military is as much as eight to one, which I, I guess that's a comparison to um, mm -hmm. similar operations that are if they were not conducted by the military. Um, yeah, so I'm absolutely. wondering if either of you have any responses on that. Well, I think you know obviously the the war in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have had you know humanitarian. Uh, rationales offered for them in, in both cases, uh, liberating women, democratization. Um, this is the, um, in an era when, when war is sort of under challenge at one level, um, militarism has morphed in, in ways that have made it more palatable, um, both by, um, you know, this kind of humanitarian gloss, um, but also through things like, you know, contracting out work, uh, paying for it through borrowing, um, so th those things make it uh, the, the labor and the, and the money um, are coming from um, future generations or from just a segment of society. So I think that's a bigger bigger problem, and it's one to and sort of keep drawing attention to as you have. But um, in our cost analysis for the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, we looked at uh, the reconstruction process and who profited from that. Um, what's called reconstruction in Iraq, for example, the $60 uh, billion uh, dollars that was spent on on supposed reconstruction, the majority of those dollars are in fact money that went to uh, security, to 
um, military and the police, and mm -hmm. and so again, one has to always ask, uh, you know, the the eight to one ratio for humanitarian operations when it in fact is, you know, about arms sales is is one thing, but in addition, when uh, the military has contracted out uh, building schools or clinics, um, the inspector general's report on that reconstruction showed. Uh, it, it, he didn't put it in a ratio like that, but it was a tremendous amount of um, waste, abuse, fraud, uh, profiteering, mm -hmm. and uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if eight to one was was conservative even. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So Joseph Gerson, who uh, has also written extensively on this subject, says the U.S. has been sending uh, B-52 bombers from Guam to conduct simulated nuclear attacks against North Korea in the course of war games and uh, the current uh, Korean crisis, and asks what, what would be the best way to figure out the financial costs of, of that particular madness? <laughs> it's, it's uh, Kathy, do you have thoughts? Well, I, I, it was in the paper this morning, and I, it made me want to cry. It's just, uh, it's an example of the costs for uh, the people of Guam of these years of of exactly this kind of you know launching of either actual war or or provocations like this against neighbors, um, and uh, the idea that the people of Guam are now under threat, uh, return threat from North Korea, um, is you know just really should be intolerable. But um, yeah, no. In terms of figuring out what the cost is, um, I I think it's you know there's so many as David's pointed out there's just so many different elements of this. Um, but it's really crucial because some of the um, these kinds of adventures, these uh, like these forays over uh, South Korea from Guam, are presented as you know they just seem to be cost free. It's you know the, we've already got the military sitting there, and 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 so this is just part of the regular Pentagon budget. But in fact, um, you know each of these decisions to you know each hour of, of flight time is is a tremendous amount of. Of money, which is then sometimes attributed to training costs, but I think again we have to keep questioning um, the, the rationales for doing these kinds of things. Um, and so, you know, looking at things like, you know, what's the interest on the debt for um, uh, those those uh, bomber planes? I mean, did, has that been uh, accounted as well? Mm -hmm. um, that those are there's a there's so many different ways in which um, one can um, go beyond just things like the the obvious the 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 jet fuel and the um, and and certainly the cost to the people in Guam of uh, the opportunity costs that uh, that David mentioned, um, all of that land that Anderson Air Force Base is on um, could be in agricultural use. It could be in on, in other kinds of um, human meeting human needs, and uh, that's a cost of sending those B-52s uh, to romp over uh, the Korean Peninsula. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess I would just add to that. It's it's a great question, and and as Kathy pointed out, impossible to come up with any um, completely accurate answer. But I would feel pretty confident that somewhere um, the Pentagon has an estimate of um, the cost per hour to operate a B-52. Um, so then you could you know figure out how many hours it takes to to fly to. Um, you know, to the Korea and back, um, how many B-52s are involved, how many, you know, how many f flights total, and you could, you could come up with some rough calculations, and, and I think often, you know, as long as you can um, justify um, the, the estimates, um, it's probably more accurate than the, the Pentagon's figures frequently. Um, and I, the other thought that comes to mind is Walter Pincus. Um, the Washington Post columnist um, does some great work looking into the weeds of Pentagon documents, and um, I don't know, maybe a, a letter to him, an email to him, might prompt him to to look into that very question. Mm -hmm. Which uh, Winslow reminds Wheeler me, is another, Winslow yeah, with, Wheeler is another great person. Right, which well, reminds me that kind of uh, sometimes when we want to research something or we want to find out something, we think, oh, we have to find that out ourselves. And sometimes there are people whose job it is to to research or investigate and, and getting a, a journalist or an academic or uh, a congressional staff person interested in the same subject um, that might mean they have better access to that information. Um, 
The uh, Christine writes that you know North Korea seems uh, on the sort of same uh, thread that North Korea seems to remain the exception to a, a trend of scaling back the military budget. Although we could probably talk about whether the budget is being scaled back. Um, so there's a the recent example of, of bolstering the quote missile defense budget. Uh, and she asks, how do you read this? Uh, you know, not only is the missile interceptor system uh, widely viewed to be ineffective, but there's clear evidence that uh, the U.S. Mil military pivot in the to the Asia Pacific region um, uh, is also uh, ineffective, and uh, or or at least it is that pivot is is occurring. Um, so, could you? Talk about the utility of organizing around alternative concepts that contest militarism, like human security or genuine security, um, to kind of reframe the whole whole debate and and then think about the way that we pay for that in a, in a much different way. Well, I, if I can just throw out one lesson that I've picked up from my colleagues on the Cost of War project, um, you know, looking at how we can reframe this. We have this sense that, you know, one of the things that we found that's so important is how long the costs are going to be uh, incurred for the war, both in Iraq and Afghan and in, uh, and mm -hmm. in the United States. And uh, to be able to then say, you know, th this idea we have that wars start on a particular date and end on a particular date. Is completely wrong. Um, we have a war system, and here's how you can tell uh, that it exists because it it will continue to churn up people and dollars um, long before and after the date. So we, you mm -hmm. know, again looking at veterans' costs, um, we had an estimate from uh, Linda Bilmes at Harvard of almost a half of a trillion dollars going forward to 2053 for veterans' medical and disability costs. And explaining to people, you know, how that could be, um, uh, how that's even a higher cost than the cost for taking care of veterans of previous wars, and that's just the United States. Uh, there's, you know, many more uh, injured, uh, seriously injured Iraqi um, military and police personnel and civilians. Um, so similar to this notion that there's going to be a multi-decade burden on uh, societies that wage war or have waged war waged against them. Mm -hmm. is, a, is an important way to break through that idea that, you know, okay, we're done with that. We've turned the page on it. Um, what's the next one? Right. Similarly to the, the costs of uh, weapon systems that are, you know, paid perhaps in, in advance of the war um, and are planned out many, many years in advance. So that's another way that we know that it's a, practically a generational cost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Stephen asks if there's a study of uh, what reparations or international legal obligations of an occupier um, uh, costs are and which have been met. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of, of studies of that, but th there may be something out there. Do either of you know of any studies on th those kinds of costs? Reparations paid by um, uh, the United States to countries that have that it's damaged. Uh, yeah, or any other occupier, I think is the mm -hmm. question. Um, I I don't know of anybody who's put it all together um, or come up with you know a list of cases. You might yeah, and I assume you'd have to at, at very least go back to to German reparations paid after World War Two. Um, but clearly. Uh, the United States owes uh, a goodly amount. Yeah, it, it might be a little bit like the, you know, the the campaigns that have occurred around reparations for um, African Americans, African Americans for slavery. You know that it's a a, a, a massive debt um, that is is can be calculated, but. Um, it, it, the discussion around it, you know, get, getting payment of it is a is a whole other kinds of task. 
Um, it, it strikes me that it, it that would be a very interesting research project, you know, especially for a student to to really think critically about what that would look like for any one country or the whole global base network. I'm with some colleagues trying to do something similar um, to calculate what the Chagosians are owed, the people of Diego Garcia, for having their homeland taken away, their land, their mm. um, and a variety of other damage. Um, so I don't know if if anyone knows some someone who might be interested in taking that on, I think it could have some real political import to have a calculation like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions, so I'm going to just combine them. One is from Gwyn, who asks um, how we can com connect our various efforts and campaigns against U.S. bases overseas into something more comprehensive. Uh, and then Ethan asks, uh, you know, he was interested in in your emphasis, David, on engaging all parties in uh, the research process. Uh, you noted the importance of including the military and asks, um, as a scholar activist, how do you approach military personnel? And if you can offer examples of doing so and how it's affected your research. Kathy, maybe I'll take that question, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to take the first. Sure. Um, uh, again, I, I think too often um, some people who might be coming from the left uh, assume that you know the military won't talk to us, or for a variety of reasons, don't just you know make a call. Um, uh, you know, so I've been doing research around the world at, at a variety of bases, and and in some cases, you know, I haven't gotten called back. I haven't had my emails answered. Um, but in most cases, um, I have um, been able to make contact with bases, been able to arrange visits, um, tours. Um, you know, often those tours, you know, they're showing me what they want to show me, of course. But even those carefully orchestrated tours are extraordinarily illuminating in my mind. Um, and they provide opportunities to talk to military personnel um, if you're there long enough. Um, to get away from the, the script. Um, uh, and of course, you also have to think about um, meeting and interviewing and talking with and engaging in dialogue with members of the military you know, off base um, and when they've retired, when they are often mm. much more free to, to share uh, their thoughts and experiences. I, I, would, I would add to that, um, uh, since I've also done some of this, that um, the higher up in rank you get, um, the less frank um, people often are. Um, those who, they, they may know more, uh, but they're more uh, kind of political uh, and they're you know, more like politicians in a way. Um, but that you still do hear some interesting things sometimes. Um, and that the people who are lower in rank are often more frank. They may know something more at the ground level, at the kind of gritty level, and have interesting. Uh, sometimes you getting an insight into the culture of the military or a particular branch or uh, operation of the military um, can also, you know, show you, tell you some interesting things. It can point you to who you should be talking to. Um, and then I also find that talking with military personnel of other countries is an important way of understanding what the U.S. is doing sometimes, since many times those military personnel have direct contact with U.S. personnel, military personnel there. You know, it's a military to military relationship. And you will you'll hear things that you won't necessarily hear from people who are on the inside of the U.S. military. Um, and if I can just add one more mm -hmm. quick point. Part of, part of my optimism about this moment is that there are some very strange bedfellows um, uh, getting in bed together. Um, there are members of the Bush administration, the former former members of the Bush administration, arguing that you know, it doesn't make any sense to have all these bases overseas. We can deploy forces from the United States to anywhere we'd want to deploy them just as fast um, as if as um, from bases in, in Europe or, um, or Asia. Um, you know, of course, we have a different views on the need and to deploy forces, but um, we shouldn't overlook the opportunities uh, provided um, by making common cause with uh, people with whom we might not 
immediately think we we share much in common. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you have thoughts on this question of uh, how we can bring our efforts together? Well, I could imagine a costs of bases project, um, like the costs of war, where um, you know people come together and and decide uh, which pieces they're going to take a primary responsibility for, and and uh, and work with academics too. I think there's a lot of hunger on university campuses to get involved with uh, practical projects um, with with folks like uh, who are on the line, and I think that um, you know it's it's really uh, you know, such a large problem that you know, you know, collaborating um, and and planning ahead to to you know take different pieces would be would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're about out of time. Uh, do either of you want to add any uh, uh, concluding thoughts? Well, I just want to thank everybody who came. Um, uh, don't want to steal your final line there, John, but um, I know by name or, or face uh, the number of people who are on on the line and uh, and I'm just uh, you know really grateful for all the work that uh, that you've all been doing all these years to uh, to make as, as David pointed out to make those of us in uh, uh, doing this work aware of it in the first place and inspiring us to you know to know that that it's it's an important and, and viable project to to fight this uh, quite giant problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David? Um, I, I would just, sorry to be scrolling around, I was looking for one slide in particular, but I would just point to um, at the end of the, the PowerPoint, which I didn't even attempt to get to, um, are some slides about recent changes um, divided by region. Uh, recent changes to the to the global based network, but I would also um, just thank everyone um, who who's on the line and um, and thank John and FOR um, for this amazing opportunity and and that's made me even more optimistic um, about working together uh, in the future. Well, thank the the, the two of you, and uh, I will make one final pitch, which is uh, if you find this webinar useful. Um, we encourage you to uh, donate to FOR to help us keep putting more of them um, out there and to uh, follow up on the kinds of collaborative work that we um, have talked about in the course of the webinar. So thanks everybody for participating and we will see you on the rebound.